Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Clark and I'm the First Impressions and Nursery Coordinator here at Eastside Church. And I just want to thank you for checking out this week's message. If you have a story you'd like to share, we would love to hear that. Email us at info at eastsidechurch.tv. And if you'd like to give online, you can do so via our website. It's eastsidechurch.co. And now, please prepare your heart for this week's message. If you got your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this is our, we're, we're coming down the road to ending uh, our Wednesday nights on a, on a every Wednesday night basis um, uh, for several different w- reasons. Number one, summer's coming. Uh, number two, construction is coming. And, uh. We're going to tear this place up eventually and rearrange everything, so it's going to be an interesting sight. Um, so that's cool. But we're going to do first Wednesdays again. We're going to kick them off, and I'm used to them being an incredibly powerful time, and we're going to really push this on Sunday morning with the two services being as full, you know, just just basically, you know, to capacity, we ought to be able to fill it up one time on the first Wednesday of the month and bring heaven down. Yeah. It ought to be an incredible night of worship. So I encourage you to put that in your calendar. That is the, um, May the 2nd. May the 2nd. Uh, it's going to be our first, first Wednesday. Another thing I want to kind of announce, um, uh, we're, we have a prayer ministry that we're really trying to move into that we feel like the Lord has really called us to. It meets on Monday night. It starts at 7 o'clock. We really want to get more and more people involved with that. I think we had 24, 24 people here praying on Monday night. Uh, this Monday night, it was absolutely power-packed, powerful, praying over the requests of the church and praying for our government and praying for the different things, our city. Uh, just, just a power-packed time. The other things that we're going to focus on in the fall is we are really going to kick off small groups to another level. Our church is ready for small groups. We have great leadership. We have a lot of people coming in from Karis uh, Bible College that are trained, that, that are in alignment with what we believe and how we can believe it. And we, can, we have plenty of people that we can say follow them as they follow Christ. So I'm excited about the possibilities of expanding our small groups. It's going to help me get to know people in this church because half the time I don't know but about half the people that are coming currently and they need to be involved with relationships. We need to make sure that that gets going. And so we're going to do that in the fall. I'm looking forward to expanding our small groups. We have a lot of small groups now, but we're going to really um, focus on growing them. So be listening if you're interested in doing a small group. We're going to begin small group leadership training in the summer so that we are ready to go when school starts back. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, I am excited. I'm, I, I don't think there's any way that I'm going to get through this material tonight. And so we have uh, three more Wednesdays, two more Wednesdays, three more Wednesdays before the first of May. How many do we have? Somebody help me. <laughs> two. So there's two more after this one. Yeah, two more after this one. Uh, and we'll probably stay on this subject for three weeks. And so we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about uh, God's miraculous gifts. Um, the reason I feel like that we need to talk about it is in the school of ministry, we kind of kind of kicked on it a little bit. And uh, there just seems to be this, this mechanic uh, intellectual approach to, to, to spiritual gifts. You know, uh, when, I was, when I started ministry, one of my first assignments was to put together a spiritual gift assessment test. Anybody ever done a spiritual gift assessment test? Okay. Um, don't feel guilty for doing one after I finished talking about them. Um, so I put them together, and, and, and it really got popular in the 90s because of Rick Warren came out and he did a spiritual gift thing. And so then it became popular with the Baptists. And because it was popular with the Baptists, it kind of went, and Rick Warren, of course, being who Rick Warren is, 
he had a lot of influence, and, and that really began to influence us, and so people started doing them everywhere. And then, you, and then, so what I tried to do is I tried to begin to find them and begin to figure out how we could actually uh, do a spiritual gift assessment. Uh, also, Bill Hybels did one. It was called Networking. It was done out of Willow Creek. Uh, anybody familiar with those people? All that happened in the late 80s, early 90s. There was another place out in Seattle, Washington, and it was a four-square church, and it had a per, it, it was it was pretty good. It, it it they did a pretty good job. Uh, what they did differently than some of the others was they made sure that with their definition of a spiritual gift, which I'm not sure that you can define it and put it. Um, you can give an idea of it, but I think it's broader most of the time than the definition will allow. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. Um, but. But what it did is that they would say it is a supernatural, God-given anointing. In other words, this is not something that you have as part of your personality. This is not a personality test. And because you are now saved, this aspect of your personality is now magnified. That's not, not what it is. And that's what it came across as oftentimes. And so what we tend to do when we start thinking about spiritual gifts is we tend to say, well, I've got that spiritual gift. Then this is my spiritual gift. This, this gift right here is my spiritual gift. And, and then we, we compartmentalize that gift, and then we identify with that gift, and then we're bound by that gift. It's really what happens. And, and when you read Corinthians, especially um, 12 and 14, 13 is kind of put in there. Did I say chapter 13? I meant chapter 12. Uh, so go to 12. 13 is put in between uh, 12 and 14. But when you read these, um, there has been all kinds of things said about it and taught about them that as a believer, I came to know Christ and got baptized in the Holy Spirit before I had any idea what that was. I had to go discover what happened to me. So I had no predetermined mindset of what this experience should manifest or how it should be played out. And so I had to go read it in Scripture. And then I'd hear teachings on it, and I'd go, well, that doesn't line up with what this says. Why, why are we taking this stance when it's not the attitude and even the attitude in which the Scripture was written? And so how can we come to that? A lot of it is used with 12 and 14 as if, if some of the gifts have ceased. So cessationalism comes from, cessationalism is the belief that, Spiritual gifts have ceased with the, since the apostolic age. After the apostles died, then there was no more need for spiritual gifts, which to me absolutely doesn't, never made any sense whatsoever when I read Scripture, nor did I, really, did I believe that, that God wasn't big enough that we would actually have a printed version 1,400 years after the cessation of the apostles, after the apostles ceased to exist, 1,400 years later, we get the Bible, which God wasn't big enough to realize that he ceased the gifts 1,400 years ago, but he put them in there so we could read about what we could have had if we'd only lived in the apostolic age. Does that make sense? And so it makes God awful small. When you think that he's not even big enough to cut that out if it was supposed to be cut out. And that then brings doubt on the whole idea of the inerrancy of the Word of God. That's the introduction. <laughs> and so when we look at this, what, what, what you're looking at, what you're looking at is a teacher, is an apostle, is a an apostle being one who wants to train leaders. He, he knows that his position is to train leaders in the church. Here is the future generations. Here, how, here is how the church is going to survive in the future. I've got to teach these people how to walk in the Spirit. I've got to teach these people about the Spirit so that they can pass it from generation to generation. There's this... There's this a uh, manifestation of the Spirit in my life that I've experienced. I had it on the Damascus Road. I was blinded by it. I went and I isolated myself for more than two years 
studying and getting to know Jesus and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is my discovery of how everything that happened to me is Old Testament. That's what Paul did. It wasn't this new revelation. It was what was talked about in the Old Testament manifest. And so he begins to teach. And what he's teaching is never that one gift should not be utilized in the church. He is teaching that you should begin to um, understand and be knowledgeable about the possibilities as you are supernaturally endowed by God to do things outside of yourself. That you can begin to operate in the miraculous that everything and every spiritual gift, including administration, is operated in the supernatural. You may have a gift of administration, but God empowers that gift on you to manifest in a way that you would never be able to manifest that gift in your life. And so there's this... There's this empowerment by God, and Paul is saying, you know, you, you're going you're gonna to begin to be empowered, but when you are empowered in the beginning, you're going to be uh, a child. You're going to be as immature in that walking out that gift or those gifts as you ever will be as you pursue God. And so grow to understand the gifts and then mature in the gifts. Grow up in the gifts. Become mature. Exercise. Do, do your due diligence. Make sure that you are operating in it the way God wants. And, and so he begins to go through this <laughs> three chapters of conversation that help us get a handle on that, on that deal. That's why I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to try to, you know, begin to teach on this and 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 segment it because it's almost like Paul doesn't take a breath. It's like he begins a conversation and he never stops, and you don't have time to interrupt him because he's bringing on the next thing. You know, he's just, whoosh, he and, and he's writing all this stuff down. And so I've got it, I've got the, you know, you, you know that the Spirit-Filled Life Bible is, is the Bible. Um, ugh, sounds too much like the New King, the King James is the only one, but, which it's not, of course, because uh, I see people who don't know me very well in, in the room, so that's not our stance <laughs> by far. Uh, in the back of this Bible, the reason I said that, it's the Holy Spirit gifts and power in the back, and it explains all the gifts, gives you all kinds of information on it. It's wonderful. So study that out. But we're going to read in the Amplified Version. Now, the Amplified Version was the message of the 90s and the 80s. It was the faith movement come alive, and they had the Amplified Version. And then the message came. Now the Passion Version is the cool version. So we're going back in time, and we're going to... We're going to take the Amplified Bible. So if you don't know anything about it, what they do is they take the Greek word and they try to expand that definition based on what the Greek word has in it. And so that's what you see oftentimes in parentheses. I think we're going to have that on the screen. Is that correct, Tiffany? Good. So you'll be able to follow along with me there as well as your version, whatever it might be. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this. Now about the spiritual gifts. The special endowments of supernatural energy. Brethren, I don't want you to be misinformed. You know that when you were a heathen, ha, you were led off after idols that could not speak. Habitually as you were led off habitually as impulse directed and whenever the occasion might arise. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking under the power of and influence of the Holy Spirit of God can ever say, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can really say, Jesus is my Lord, except by and under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so immediately what you need to understand is you need to get away from your mechanical, intellectual approach to uh, discovering 
your walk with the Holy Spirit because you have to understand that it's relationship. Your, your moving and growing in the Holy Spirit is all about your relationship with God. Jesus said this in Acts. He said, he said listen, I, 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 or right at the end of John, listen, go, go to Jerusalem and wait there. Wait until the promise comes, and they go and they wait in the room. Now, it's interesting how many go and actually wait. It's, 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 about, it's a lot less than he actually told to go wait. And so well, there's a remnant that actually go do it. And, and, and he says, wait till you receive the promise. And then the promise of the Holy Spirit came. And Jesus said, it's the, to, your, uh, to, to our advantage that he go away, because he couldn't send the Holy Spirit unless he went away. And when he went away, he would send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would never leave you or forsake you. No matter what you go through, the Holy Spirit is going to be with you. And it is the third person of the Trinity. It is God. It is in submission to Jesus and the Father. Jesus did and said everything he heard and saw the Father do. And the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal the truth in everything that Jesus said and did. And so you see perfect authority and perfect submission in the Godhead with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You tracking with me so far? So, so Jesus says, I got to go. When I go, I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He's the one who sends the Holy Spirit to baptize you, and you're full. And now you're in relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in you. There's a passage of Scripture that I love so much that says that the Father and the Son will make His residence in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because every attribute that the Father has, the Son has. Every attribute the Son has, the Spirit has. And so all the attributes of God are residing in us as believers filled with the Holy Spirit. So then why don't we act like it? Because you still have the control option of walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit. If you walk in your marriage in the Spirit, you have a good marriage. If you walk in the flesh in your marriage, woe be unto whoever is living with you. Liz always says, you're a great husband in the spirit. In the flesh, it's very questionable. And so, and so we get better and better at submitting ourselves and allowing ourselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit and actually walking in the spirit, making decisions based on what the Spirit of God reveals about the truth of what Jesus said. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's walking in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, it's to our advantage that he go away so that he could send the Holy Spirit. And so your development of maturity is based on your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf. The Spirit of God is living in you. You have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus. You have a companion and friend in the Holy Spirit as He whispers to you, as He nudges you, as He is grieved. You know if you're sensitive to the things of God when you grieve the Holy Spirit. You can, you can all of a sudden, for some reason, know that you make a decision intentionally that is contrary to the things of God, and immediately you feel grieved. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, oftentimes what's being done is you're getting revelation of the condition of the Holy Spirit. He's grieved, and so you're deeply grieved enough that you don't want to make that same mistake again that you want to do what's right. And so Paul is, Paul is beginning to identify that 
And as we read this, we have to understand that there's this special endowment of supernatural energy no matter what the gift is. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and do this because when we read it, it might, be, it might be easier. So let me get four, if you want to stay, you can stay, four ladies right here, four ladies right here. Can you you know, face this way, this way we have, now you, you are there too, Leanne, I'm not, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> Now when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about all kinds of gifts, and what we tend to do is we tend to say, well, Leanne, Leanne, you know, she is very creative, so she most likely has some semblance of creative communication. Abby is the same, but she's also administrative, and she, I mean, uh, Bailey, and she also can teach. And she has, so all those kind of things. So let's just say that she might have the gift of teaching is one of her main manifestations. And, and so we pigeonhole her into teaching. She, this is a, wow, we got all creative people up here. We got a creative church, you know it? So let's, let's, let, let me make one up. Let's say that, that, that she has uh, the gift of encouragement. Because it, let me just tell you about encouragement. In the spirit, an encourager is fun to be around. They're incredibly fun to be around because they constantly encourage you. Oh, you're doing great. You're doing great. You're doing great. In the flesh, they're the most critical, obnoxious people you've ever been around. And you run from them because they're constantly going to find out what you're doing wrong. Amen. This is what's wrong with that. That's what's wrong with that. So you might have the gift of encouragement. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right. So so let's say uh, let's say hospitality. You know. And so I say okay. So we see all those things. And we say, well, this is what Leanne and this is Bailey and this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Megan, thank you so very much. Whew, Fifty-eight <laughs> microphone. You get where I'm at? That's not it. That's not the way it works. It is totally the way we do it because it is something that we can that we can somehow digest easy and and we can we can do a little deal. Well, this is number one. This is number two. This is number three. We can kind of put it in order in our mind and we can begin to to handle it. But that's not the way it is because every bit of God is in Leanne. She, she is filled with everything God has, right? She is filled with everything God has. She is filled with everything God has. She is filled with everything God has. And if she has the gift of administration and she has the gift of administration, they're not the same. They manifest different in each individual. Because there's relationship, there's personality, there's ways of thinking. And God is not limited to one way of doing things. He manifests himself through his creation in different ways. That's why that's an arm, that's an eye, that's a hand. It's the individual and not the gift that these passages of Scripture are talking about. So, when we read this, we've got to understand that in the relationship with God, He's going to manifest Himself differently, but He is all you need. You have every spiritual gift available to you. And you start as a child. And Paul is saying, grow up. Move forward. Expand your horizons. Be filled. Do the miraculous. And if you can't do the little, you're not going to do the great. If he trusts you with, he'll give you much. Right? Thank you. Let's give them applause.
And so we're going to read this, and we're going to, I want you to see how all this, it, what Paul is doing is he's saying, you know, he's not saying, don't do this gift. This gift's not important. Be careful. Everything in order. Let's get real religious. That's not, that's not the attitude of it at all when you read it. So you know that when you were a heathen, <laughs> you went all kinds of different directions by impulse. Therefore, I want you to understand it, 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 that no one speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit can do so without Jesus. Verse 4. There are distinctive varieties and distributions of endowments, gifts, extraordinary powers, distinguishing certain Christians due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls by the Spirit. And they vary. <clears throat> now, when he's talking about this, he's, not, he's talking about in this moment, the power of the Holy Spirit comes on Pastor Alex, and he's operating in maybe as a teacher or a prophet, but can he be merciful? Can he operate in the gift of mercy when the gift of mercy is needed? Only in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I call Liz and find out how to. Liz, the Lord wants me to operate in mercy. Can you give me some pointers? No, I don't. I don't. I, I, I'm making fun of that, but that's not true. It has everything to do with my willingness to submit to the power of the Holy Spirit and get outside of myself, get beyond my natural tendency to be a jerk. <laughs> so don't look at me like you're not guilty. <laughs> All right? So there are, there are different in, uh, gifts, and, and, and there's this grace operating in our souls, and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. But no matter how they vary, the Holy Spirit remains the same. And there are distinctive varieties of service and administration or ministration, but it is the same Lord who is served. And there are distinctive varieties of operation, of working to accomplish things, but it's the same God who inspires and energizes them all, in all. It's the same God who does the work in each person. It just manifests differently because of the individual being used. And I can promise you that the gift of prophecy through Liz when she prophesies doesn't look like the gift of prophecy when I do. It just doesn't look the same. It looks different, but it's the same spirit. There are distinctive, verse 6 is where I'm at, right? Yes, and there are distinctive varieties of operation of working to accomplish things, but it's the same God who inspires and energizes them all in all. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit. For wh Why does he do it? For good and to profit. So the gifts are given so that we profit. To one is given in and through the Holy Spirit the power to speak a message of wisdom. And to another, the power to express a word of knowledge and understanding according to the same Holy Spirit. To another, wonder working faith by the same Holy Spirit. To another, the extraordinary powers of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophetic insight, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose of God. To another, the ability to discern and distinguish between the utterances of true spirits and false ones. To another, various kinds of unknown tongues. To another, the ability to interpret such tongues. All these gifts, achievements, abilities are inspired and brought to pass by one and the same Holy Spirit who apportions to each person individually exactly as he chooses. Exactly. 
exactly as he chooses. Now, do you think when the gift of encouragement is needed that you're going to operate in a different gift? No. You're going to operate in the gift that the Holy Spirit needs you to operate in to bring good and profit to whatever circumstance you might be finding yourself in. The, the, the end result of the supernatural, miraculous work of God's power working in a Christian is to bring profit to the individual that that spiritual gift is manifesting on. Not this individual, but the one you're praying for or whatever might be happening. He is trying to bring good. And what, Paul, you, what you're going to see here is what Paul says is that that's how you know the manifest presence of God is in a congregation of believers. How do you know? Well, they're, they're maturing in their operation of the spiritual gifts. You ready? Where am I? 12? For just as the body is, is a unity and yet has many parts, and all the parts, though many, form only one body, so it is with Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. For by means of the personal agency of one Holy Spirit, we were all, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, baptized and by baptism united together into one body and all made to drink of one Holy Spirit. For the body does not consist of one limb or organ, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm a hand, not the hand, I do not belong to the body, would it be therefore not a part of the body? If the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, would it be therefore not a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense, what, what would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, what would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as he wished, and saw fit and with the best adaptation. But if the whole were all a single organ, where would the body be? And now there are certainly many limbs and organs, but a single body. Can you see relationship? Can you see the individual people, whether slave, free, Jew, Greek. It's individuals that God uses the spiritual gifts, the manifestation of His Spirit in the church to, to bring about not only unity, but the power of God at work in the, in the midst of us. So what verse am I in now? Thank you. 21, I thought that's where it was. And the eye is not able to say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But instead, there is absolute necessity for the parts of the body that are considered the most weak. And those parts of the body which we consider rather ignoble are the very parts which we invest with additional honor. And our unseemly parts, as those unsuitable for exposure, are treated with seem leanness, modesty, and decorum. Which are more presentable parts do not require, which are more presentable parts do not require. Now that's really all hard to read. Y'all just don't have to do it. But God has so adjusted, mingled, harmonized, and subtly portioned the parts of the whole body, giving the greater honor and richer endowment to the inferior parts which lack apparent importance so that there should be no division or discord or lack of adoption of the parts of the body to each other. But the members all alike should have a mutual interest in and care for one another. That's just, that's just honoring people. And if one member suffers, all the parts share in the suffering. If one member is honored, all the members share in the enjoyment of that honor. Now you collectively are Christ's body and individually you are members of it each part severally and distinct, each with his own place and function. So God has appointed some in the church for his own use, first apostles, special messengers, second prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, third teachers, the wonder workers, then those with ability to heal the sick, helpers, administrators, speakers in different unknown tongues, 
Are all apostles, special messengers, are all prophets? The answer to all these are no. Inspired interpreters of the will and purpose of God are all teachers. Do all have the power of performing miracles? Do all possess extraordinary powers of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But And the answer is, but earnestly desire. You ready? But earnestly desire and zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts and graces, the higher gifts and the choicest graces. And yet I will show you still a more excellent way, one that is better by far than the highest of them all, and that's love. Now, what he went through all that and says, does everybody operate in these, in these gifts? And we answered, did he say they never will? He did not. What he says is, earnestly desire and zealously cultivate those gifts that you don't have. That is missing in all the gift assessment tests. The gift assessment test gets you to pinpoint one gift that you have in that makes it impossible to do what the instruction really is to do in 1 Corinthians. He did everything he said in chapter 12. He finished in 31 by saying, earnestly desire and zealously cultivate every gift, the most important gifts, right? If you think that you have the gift of encouragement and that's all you're going to operate in, you will not cultivate the better gifts. So then he says, I got this way of showing you. And, and then Paul didn't know it, but all we use 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for is to do weddings. <laughs> but it ain't talking about weddings. And it's not talking about marriage. It's talking about how to operate in spiritual gifts. He says this is agape love that can only come from God. And if you don't operate in that spiritual gift with that agape love, the God kind of love, the kind of love that you're incapable of operating in, unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit, unless you do that, you're going to be a, 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 like a clanging symbol to all the world. And so first thing you got to do is you've got to make sure that you're, you're wanting to cultivate these gifts in you, but you've got to make sure you do it with an attitude of love that you can only get from the Father. You can only get it when it comes from God. And the only way to get it from God is to be in relationship with the Holy Spirit and be sensitive to his direction. And who's screaming back there? His direction. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is coming in the three-year-old room back there. Did y'all hear that? Somebody raise their hands and shout. And do like, you're talking about the Holy Spirit, and here it comes. All right, now let, let me, I'm going to skip to 14, chapter 14. I'm just going to read. Just the first little bit, and then we're going to pick up on this the next week, okay? Good so far? Help you, help you understand that you've got to be in relationship with the Holy Spirit and God, and you're to cultivate all these spiritual gifts. You're not to depend on your pastor or anybody your pastor puts in leadership to operate in these gifts, and you sit back on your hands. That's not, that's not my job. As a pastor, my job is to train you to begin to do this, and your job is to actually do it. Now, I can be doing it with you because I'm a son of God just like you. I just have a, an administrative role. But look what Paul writes in, in, in chapter 14 as he starts it all. He said, so, I, I, I want you, he ends 12, he ends 12 by saying, one, two, three. There it is. He ends 12 by saying, But earnestly desire and zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts, and the graces. Grace is God's power working in your circumstances that does exceedingly abundantly above what you could do on your own strength. 
That's what grace is. You operate in that grace. And then he says you can't operate in that grace. You can't do these things unless you learn how to do it in love. That's 13. And then he, after he puts 13 in, it's like he put a parenthesis at, at the beginning of 13, and then he finished, and that was one sentence, and he picks back up in 14 with what he left off of in 12. As he bookends that, and he says in 14, Eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love and make it your aim, your great quest, and earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual endowments, the gifts, especially that you prophesy. Interpret the divine will and purpose and inspire preaching and teaching. Now, he's going to go on in 14, and he's going to, he's going to say how that, you know, kind of how that's all put together. And this is basically what he says, and I'm going to give you this so you'll come back next week. Basically, this is what he says. You know, if you pray in the Spirit, if you've got this heavenly language that is described in Romans chapter 8, that you, that you pray in, in a language that you don't understand. You have no ability to understand it. Paul talks about it here in just a moment in 14. He says, if you do that without interpretation, that is the most fundamental, foundational gift there is. Everybody, he says, I want everybody to pray in tongues. I want everybody to do that. That is the foundational gift gift to begin to build on and I can put it like this it's the most immature gift that you're going to have and your job is to move from doing that all the time to a place where you when you do do that you actually get the understanding and so then you can begin to to speak in a language that somebody understands and it is actually the will and purposes of God for that given situation. God says the most immature place you can be is just to pray in a language that you don't understand. But he's not saying that's not a good thing to do. He's saying that is the beginning place. Grow up. <laughs> this is so stinking good. Because <laughs> we need it. You know, when, when Michael says pray in the Spirit, sing in the Spirit, we need to all, there, ain't, there doesn't need to be a soul that doesn't need to be singing in the Spirit because we're submitting to his authority. When Michael Wallace is leading worship or JP's leading worship or whoever's leading worship, whatever song it might be, when they give us a, 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 a directive, we need to be attuned to what he's saying because as a unit, we can, we can do damage on hellish forces by coming in, in in a unified front, shouting to God, lift up holy hands, clap to the Lord. Do you know when you clap, I got eight minutes, when you clap, that is actually saying I'm coming into contract with this. That's what they used to do. So when we, when we declare the word of the Lord in a song, and Michael says shout or, 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 or give praise, when we clap our hands, we're, you need to think, you don't need golf claps. You need to clap your hands and say, I'm coming into agreement with what the Word of God says, and I'm pulling it down from heaven, and so be it on earth, because God's Word is alive and well. I'm agreeing with that. And when He gives that command, we need to be in unity to, to move forward as an army of God that does work on hellish forces. That's how spiritual gifts work. There's no room for timidity in the house of God. And so, as we get to part two and, and 14, it's going to go about how, how we're going to do that. And what we're going to talk about is how they actually operate next week and probably, the, the, uh, probably get into um, you know, just how they intermingle. Because sometimes it's hard to differentiate, was that knowledge, was that prophecy, was that, you know, what was that? What gift was that? And we get so bogged down with that mess. What it was was relationship with the Holy Spirit. And what he wants to do is he wants to bring back good and profit. 
What, what's the gift for? Well, let's figure out the gift. No, let's bring good and profit. Right? Let's bring heaven down in this place. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, open our minds, get our vision, get, get us to get, get out of our compartmentalization or, or our, 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 our warning to receive from you step one, step two, step three, step four. You don't work like that. You say, trust me, follow me, and, and, and do it when you're uncomfortable. You're going you're gonna to have to trust me if you want me to lead you. The only way I'm leading you is through trust. When you put your trust in me, I'll, I'll lead you, says the Lord. So, Father, we want to trust you. We want you to manifest in this congregation of believers through spiritual gifts, especially that we bring the word and the will of God to circumstances and situations as we declare it over people and, their, and what they're facing as we bring heaven to earth. Father, let that be done in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Won't you hug like 24?